first of all, let me thank you for um, uh, inviting me to come uh, speak here in Ghent. It's always wonderful, of course, uh, to be back here. I was born here, I was raised here, and left uh, uh, Ghent about 13, 14 years ago, and have uh, since uh, worked in the United States. Um, it's wonderful to have great colleagues such as yourself, uh, Patrick, Frank, and so forth, uh, with whom I worked for uh, so many years here. It's great, uh, and I mean that, uh, to be back here. My talk actually, uh, the topic of my talk was given to me by Patrick Hoxtenbach, who sent me a mail a while ago. And he uh, inquired, well, this, this thing I heard about research objects, and is that actually something I should be following? And I thought, well, if Patrick is interested in that topic, then most likely uh, a lot of colleagues, uh, library technologists, uh, might be interested in, uh, in that topic. So that will really be the core, uh, the thread of uh, my presentation uh, today. It is a topic that uh, squarely fits in the work that I've been doing over the past uh, decade also. Work that is to be situated in the painful transition that the scholarly communication system is going through from a system that was fully paper-based to a system that is really just a scanned copy of the paper-based system and hopefully and eventually Some fundamental inspiration for this presentation uh, was provided to me by a fantastic keynote that Carol Goebel uh, from Computer Science at the University of Manchester did last year at the Joint Conference for uh, Digital Libraries. <coughs> and in her keynote, Carol talked about this brave new world of science where basically the entire scientific life cycle, everything pertaining to scientific endeavor happens in silico. Every aspect of the research is conducted on computers. It is a totally born digital kind of science. And the context of this kind of science are the so-called e-laboratories. They are collaborative and distributed environments that allow to conduct these uh, kind of in silico experiments. They use data, they use computational processes to obtain uh, scientific uh, results. It's just one tiny... actionable services, so APIs that sit on top of all that scientific data. And then these workflows are executed on top of a workflow engine. And so what you see here is a highly interconnected and interdependent environment. And the interesting thing here, and this is really at the core of the problem statement that I want to make, is that Every aspect of this environment is continuously in flux. There's nothing stable about any of this. And this is an environment that we do scientific uh, experiments in. Workflows are changing, are modified the entire time. 
the workflow language uh, may change. The catalog obviously changes, but the APIs that are described in the catalog is changing. The way the APIs are implemented, the algorithms are changing. The data obviously sitting behind these APIs changes. The workflow engine software changes, and underlying all of this are obviously operating systems, and so, and all of that changes also. So this is continuously uh, in flux, continuously changing. <coughs> and actually, it's a very volatile kind of environment. <coughs> and so, a lot of Carol Goebel's talk was about the reproducibility of science in such an environment. As you all know, reproducibility of uh, uh, research results is an extremely important aspect. And Carol asked the fundamental question, in such an environment where everything is continuously on the move, is it even conceivable that a research result that was obtained today in this computer-based distributed environment will be uh, reproduced in a year from now? Okay. And the answer to that is actually the topic of the Workflow Forever project that runs uh, at the University of Manchester. <coughs> The answer to that question is most likely way less positive uh, than you would hope. And <clears throat> basically, Carol was talking about, yeah, most likely it's going to be extremely hard to truly reproduce uh, research results in these kind of environments. And hence, they come up with all these nuances on the term reproducibility to kind of start to approximate something uh, like reproducibility. For example, the term replayability. No, we are not going to be able to run these experiments again on computer environments and achieve exactly the same results, but what we could do is actually take a log, uh, document precisely the entire environment in which the experiment happened. You know, all the software components, the operating system components, the versions of the APIs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to later on be able to re-introspect and say, oh, indeed, in this kind of environment, with this version of the data and so on, they arrived at that kind of a research result. So true reproducibility may not be achievable, but maybe some uh, shape or form of it uh, may be. Another thing that Carol was talking about was that not only do we want to be able to reproduce these results, or components in arriving at those results, we may also want to allow others to reuse. Reuse models that we used, reuse software, reuse workflows, uh, and so on. And again, there's a whole variation on the team of reuse, like repurpose, refresh, reconstruct, and so on, and so on. Again, in order to allow that, it's going to be essential to document in heavy, in explicit detail, all the components of the environments, all the contributors to that scientific process uh, that was used to actually obtain uh, a research uh, result. <clears throat> in computational sciences, it's been known for a long time <coughs> that the traditional scholarly communication system does not allow conveying that kind of information, that level of detail, to be able to reconstruct the entire setting of a computational experiment. This is a quote from a paper from 1995, as a matter of fact, so these were pioneers of computational science. And basically what they're saying is that an article about computational science is merely advertisement of the research. The true stuff actually is in the software development environment, the data, the complete set of instructions that generated the results. There's no way, they said, that you can communicate any of this in the traditional scholarly communication system. Two years ago, Sean Beckhofer, who works in Carol Goebel's group in Manchester, <coughs> in the paper about research objects, basically reaches the same conclusion. He only uses a kind of Britishism. He's very nice, and he basically says, in this 
new kind of environment of in silico science. There's not a whole lot that we can do with the traditional communication system. And he basically says uh, it is challenging the traditional scholarly publication, by which I mean there's nothing really we can do with it. <coughs> and so we're facing this true challenge that the reality is that science, maybe currently we call it computational science, but this is just a thing that is going to come for a lot of the sciences and scholarship in general, that we're moving towards completely computer-based, in silico environment. And the scholarly communication system that we have can just com not communicate the things that need to be communicated in order to allow for some shape or form of reproducibility and reuse. So there is clearly a need to be able to reuse and reproduce these things, <coughs> and we cannot achieve any of it in the traditional scholarly communication system. So the question becomes, so well, what are we going to do? How are we going to accommodate this need? This need to document all these aspects of in silico experiments so that they would be reproducible and re of uh, scholarly communication system, registration, certification, awareness, archiving, rewarding have all been implemented in a certain way and have been implemented like that for many years. And so one could say, all right, well, you know what we're going to do? Since we have the system already, let's embellish it a bit, let's add some bells and whistles, and let's try and accommodate all those needs for in silico science in the established system. Now, you know as well as I do how fixated that system is, how extremely hard it is to initiate any kind of change in the existing uh, scholarly communication system. We can talk about that for a couple of hours if we would like to. So there's people that say, well, maybe that's not what we want to do. And maybe we want to start with a clean slate. of this knowledge vessel and how are we going to deal with registration of those certification etc etc still there's people that think in the direction that maybe this is where we should go because achieving what we need to achieve in this traditional environment is just not going to be viable and this is what leads to the notion of uh, research objects <coughs> again coming out of um, uh, University of Manchester and Oxford University. <coughs> and research objects are actually these kind of, or is a proposal, let me call it, of this kind of a knowledge uh, vessel in which we can bundle up all these things that we need to be able to introspect in hindsight on in silico experiments and to be able to try and reuse some of those components. So we talk about components <coughs> for a research object that are the data that we use to produce uh, results, the methods employed to produce them, provenance information about that, the people involved in the investigation, and annotations about all of these resources so that we would be able to understand what they all uh, really meant and what their contribution was to the scientific endeavor. Mind you, if it was not clear to you yet, that we're talking about a knowledge vessel of which the primary consumer are machines and not humans. And that's why I emphasized at the outset of my talk that we're talking here about the scholarly communication system that's not only targeted at humans, but also uh, as machines. And so 
around this notion of research objects, of which John Beckhofer has actually published uh, two papers, there's now been um, a group, a W3C uh, community group that was created to discuss how to go forward with this notion. You know, what does this thing really look like? Uh, what's topology? What are the semantics? Uh, what are the requirements? Uh, and so on. And this is actually what Patrick Hochstenbach sent me a mail about. He said, should I join this group or uh, you know, should I just uh, wait a little? Is this worth uh, my time? There's actually already some kind of an outline, let's say more or less theoretical outline of what such a research object uh, could look like. And so the outer circle basically says it's about bundling together all things that are relating to a, an in silico experimental study. And so it is a bundle of things, and obviously the bundle has identity. And it aggregates stuff, and as we said, we need to be able to annotate the stuff that's aggregated. There's provenance information. There's the notion that these objects can evolve over time, and so on. And actually, I'm going to walk you through these kind of features or requirements one by one, because I want to illustrate that a lot of these things <coughs> I've actually been working on in uh, the past couple of years. So first of all, as I mentioned, research objects are aggregations of content. It is all that kind of stuff that plays into in silico experiments that we want to uh, bundle up together. Now aggregations, obviously, for me, rings a bell because there was this project I was involved in around 2007, it was called OAI Object Reuse and Exchange, and this was all about uh, aggregations. The consideration there was that scholarly assets are evolving from being atomic things like PDFs to you know, groups, aggregations uh, of uh, resources that contain data sets, software, ontologies, workflows, slide blogs, and so on and so on. And that these aggregations are uh, characterized by various interdependencies and relationships. And OAI-OR was all about how are we going to convey this compoundness of these new types of scholarly uh, resources in an interoperable way. And again, of course, we're talking about how are we going to convey this kind of compoundness towards uh, machines. So this is really the problem that we are used to in digital libraries as the compound object problem. Only we look at it from uh, the perspective of the web not from the perspective of repositories. And there was a very simple uh, motivational example that we used, basically just looking at an archive, uh, uh, an object in the um, physics archive, you can already see this compoundness and this variety of relationships and interdependencies uh, appear. So you have a URI here for the splash page, that's obviously not a URI of the asset itself. You have the asset itself in different formats. We have different identifiers related to this thing. way. ORE was, for myself and for the people involved in this effort, an extremely important shift in thinking. You remember probably that I did stuff like protocol for metadata harvesting also. <coughs> you look at that and you see a totally repository-centric way to solve interoperability problems. Basically you say, well, here's a repository, I'm putting an interface in front of it, and now if the other does the same, now we have interoperability. 
a fundamental shift in ORE was that in order to solve this problem of interoperability, rather than looking at it from the perspective of repositories, look at it from the perspective of the web and try and solve the entire interoperability problem using the primitives of the web architecture, URIs, resources, representations, links, and uh, so on and so forth. And so this is what you see happening in ORE, that we come up with a solution that is truly embedded in uh, the web architecture. All the work that I've been, done, I've been doing since then, and several of my colleagues, has been fundamentally influenced by the insights we gained in this. At this point in time, this probably sounds totally obvious. Well, of course, that's how you're going to do it because the web is the infrastructure. Believe me, for many years, especially when there was a background in digital libraries, this was not obvious at all. And so if there's a message in this for you library technicians, it is look for all your problems to the web architecture, do not think from the perspective of your uh, internal repositories. <clears throat> so how are we going to solve this problem of um, aggregations on the web? Well, here's how. So it's, let's say this is the web, these thingies are resources, and there's links between those resources. And now an aggregation from the perspective of the web basically is a bunch of resources that belong together because someone says they belong together, maybe because they're all related to the same scientific experiment, let's just say. Now there's stuff missing in order to convey that. The stuff that's missing is, well actually, the contour around it, you know, someone that basically said, ha, ah, these all belong together, and then in order to be able to talk about the thing on the web, of course you need an identity, you need a URI. So that's the other thing that is missing. And in order to add that, the only thing that you're really going to do is you're going to publish a document that states all of that. So first we introduce a URI, a new identity, and that identity stands for the union of all these resources. And then we introduce another resource, and this resource is actually going to describe this. It's going to describe there exists this thing with this URI, and that is the union of all of these. It's as simple as that. You wanted to add this kind of aggregation information to the web graph. You're basically just publishing a document in the web that states that these things belong together and that this is their identity. This describes that. If I arrive here, I can discover that. That just link data principles. And then we come up with this small vocabulary, really, <coughs> that says, well, here's an aggregation. It actually aggregates these resources. And there's this document that we call a resource map that uh, actually describes uh, this aggregation. ORE has, meanwhile, uh, been adopted in quite a few projects. Europeana, the Digital Public Library of America, actually quite a few uh, e-science projects uh, are implementing it also. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, to the best of my knowledge, there's not a single publisher, scientific uh, publisher, for whom this actually was made that has adopted it uh, until now. So there's very little, like this, that you can say in the resource map, but the resource map can also describe an awful lot, so not just the fact that this aggregates these resources, but it can express a whole bunch of relationships, a whole bunch of metadata, and uh, what have you. I'd just like to note, coming back to this whole notion of research objects, that after the ORE work, I published a paper uh, with Christine Borgman and Alberto Pepe that actually was not just looking at ORE from the perspective of let's just bundle up a couple resources, but actually this whole notion that you find back in research objects of taking entire parts of the scientific life cycle. that point. 
So we need the notion of aggregation in research objects, and it seems to me that ORE would be a good candidate technology and that is actually recognized by the people that are in charge of the research um, uh, object uh, effort. Uh, there's a couple of challenges, but uh, it, that may have to lead to tiny revisions of the ORE specification, but I'm going to uh, skip on that. So we have a candidate technology, at least for uh, this component. And the other thing that we needed <coughs> was annotation. It said annotation about these resources, essential to understand the outcomes captured by all the stuff that sits in the research. Huh, now that rings a bell also. Since 2009, with a couple of dear colleagues, I've been involved in this project uh, that was called uh, the Open Annotation Collaboration. And the consideration there was that annotation is obviously a pervasive activity uh, in scholarship, but there's a big problem in that people are making annotations with dedicated annotation clients, the dedicated annotation servers, and the annotations can never leave that environment. So they, li they live in these niches, kind of. And here was the vision of interoperability for annotation and how to establish that. Basically, the vision was that it should be possible to have a collection, let's say, of uh, historical maps here. And there would be a bunch of people or machines that would be annotating uh, these maps. <clears throat> and then there would be another group, and they would have ancient manuscripts, and there would be people annotating these manuscripts. And that if you would surface both sets of annotations up into the semantic cloud, actually these things may merge. And you would get an integration of disparate collections up there through these annotations without these groups actually knowing anything about each other. They are just doing their work over here. The others are doing their work over there. They may hopefully use some kind of common semantic notion, for example, tag everything with DBpedia URIs or so on. When you do that, you publish your annotations, you surface them to the cloud, suddenly they connect. And suddenly the manuscript collection is integrated with the map collection without anyone actually really talking to each other. That was the vision uh, behind this. As you see, 2009, that was the start of the project, and we're actually still at this. This is one of the projects um, that are quite long-lasting, as you can tell. The good news here is that as we were working on the open annotation collaboration, there was a parallel effort under the name of annotation ontology by Paolo Cicarese at Harvard University. <coughs> we heard of each other and actually motivated by Ivan Hermann, who is the W3C semantic web lead, decided why have these two things, let's work together, let's uh, reconcile our efforts. And that's an effort that is currently going on and has already resulted to a first uh, joint specification under the umbrella of a W3C uh, community group. It's an extremely uh, active group, a lot of participants, there's an awful uh, lot of extremely uh, interesting uh, debate uh, going on. <coughs> the core issue throughout the effort, almost an unsolvable issue, is defining what an annotation is. This is actually, not, we're not the first to find that. There's been so many annotation efforts in the past, in digital library environments, in the semantic web environment also. And the hardest thing is kind of to figure, what the hell, we all kind of know an annotation when we see one, but what the hell, how do you define what it is? And so you, you know, you just come up with uh, an annotation. I know that some of you here have been following uh, the BitFrame uh, discussions. And <clears throat> BitFrame also involves the notion of annotation. And there's a little uh, controversy about them not using, uh, or not yet using, the open annotation uh, approach. I read 
Those email exchanges in quite some detail, I didn't contribute, but I read them. And my observation really is that at the core of this discussion is really the question, what is an annotation? And is the notion of an annotation for which Bibframe wants to use it really the right metaphor? Is that really what they want to do? And so I'm not going to dwell on this. I just think it's extremely interesting, again, to illustrate that it's kind of controversial to say, you know, what, what exactly uh, is an annotation? People annotate for so many uh, different reasons. Anyhow, uh, just one more illustration of how subtle this can be. What you see here is a visualization. It's something about uh, tweets and languages. See different uh, languages in uh, tweets in different languages. I think uh, somewhere in London around the time of the Olympics. And there's this guy here, he provides a command uh, to this visualization. And clearly, I think we would all agree that you could consider this to be an annotation on the visualization. Now let me turn things around. And of course, this visualization was created on top of a data set, right? You take the data, you visualize it, and then well, would we also say that the visualization is an annotation to the data set? Well, it's kind of weird. Maybe we wouldn't say that. And this is how subtle it gets. Now, once you can get over this whole philosophical discussion about what an annotation is, you basically can say, well, I'm going to specify a model, and that's what an annotation is, okay? And this is what we did in the open annotation effort. And here you see the core of the model. This is again all RDF based, obviously. And an annotation here is a resource with URI. It is of type uh, open annotation. And it is motivated by something. Why did I make this annotation? Oh, actually, I was editing uh, a resource. That's my motivation. And the annotation has a body. And that body is somehow about the target. So in this case, what would happen, how to read this editing thing, is that the body, and body one, that's a URI also, basically is an edit of the target, uh, which is uh, this resource here. And then within this model, there's an awful lot of use cases that you can cover. And I must say, over the past four years of the open annotation effort, there's been an in-depth study of all kind of scholarly use cases. It's been amazing how much energy uh, has gone uh, into all this. And so here you see an annotation that actually doesn't even have a body. It's just a bookmark. And there's this person said, oh, I'm going to bookmark this because at one point I would like to use uh, this data set here. And when I say has target here, and I show the data set here, obviously the target really is the URI uh, of this uh, data set. In a similar vein, here's an annotation that has as motivation uh, commenting. You see this document is actually a comment on that data set. There's also a possibility to include uh, textual, uh, direct inline textual annotations, obviously, which is a very common use case. Semantic tagging is extremely important both for human and machine use cases, and this is covered by the model. So here you have tagging as a motivation, and then you see that we are tagging this data set with a DBPD URI, and we're making explicit that this is a semantic tag to avoid that the client would actually dereference this URI and think that the document behind this URI is actually annotating this. So it's literally this URI that is annotating uh, this. All of the examples I've given so far are annotations that pertain to an entire uh, resource that is identified by URI. As you all know, most resources, actually uh, most annotations pertain to parts of resources, like a part of an image, a piece of text, and so on, and so on. And the model also accommodates that by means of uh, specific resources that allow you basically to describe by means of a selector 
which part of a resource you're talking about, and then just add your annotation uh, over that. I'm not going to go into any further detail. If you're into annotation and you don't want to miss the boat, I think you should have a look at the uh, open annotation uh, specification. I think there's an enormous uh, amount of momentum behind that effort currently. The current, so there are already out there some prototypes of research objects <coughs> provided by the people of uh, Manchester University. They are currently using, uh, the, they're based on the open an, um, uh, annotation uh, ontology model created by Paolo Cisa Uccicarese. But given the fact that we are merging these two efforts, it's fair to assume that in the future, annotation in research objects will be covered uh, by the W3C an open annotation spec. Okay, we got two technologies down, two candidate technologies to handle or to use in these research objects. We have another thing that we want to cover. This was versioning and evolution. Now that rings a bell for me also. So research objects are dynamic. I emphasize that very seriously at the outset. The content can change and be changed. Resources that aggregate it may change. There's a need for versioning, and there's a need for retrieving objects or aggregated uh, uh, resources at particular historical points in their life cycle. Now, now. <coughs> in 2007, this was actually while we were still coming up with uh, specification for ORE, I did this experiment with my team in Los Alamos. I got kind of totally intrigued by this notion of, okay, now we have these aggregations of resources. So remember, we have the resource map, we have the URI of the aggregation, we have these aggregated resources. And got obsessed by, well, these things are alive, right? They actually, uh, we can, add new resources to an aggregation, we can remove resources from an aggregation. Since these aggregated resources live on the web, they change continuously, and I got obsessed by this notion of how will we know what the state of such an aggregation was at a certain point in time? How will we track the evolution of uh, such things? And so the experiment was all about, we simulated publishers of these kind of aggregations. Aggregations that were dynamic, so that would change uh, over time. <coughs> and we said, so how are we going to create these kind of snapshot versions of them to be able to look at them uh, in the future? Turns out that because we had based the entire ORE framework on top of the web architecture, we could just use off-the-shelf web archiving infrastructure to achieve what we wanted to do. We could just use the heretic scroller and Wayback Machine software and go and recurrently collect these aggregations and their aggregated resources and basically freeze their state in a, a web archive. And so, again, because we had taken this uh, web-centric approach, we were able to reuse uh, those tools. And in essence, what we were able to do, when we knew where the archive was that contained these versions, these old versions of these aggregations, we were able to go in and have a look at the state of, uh, of these uh, <coughs> aggregations and these aggregated resources. What we were not able to do was basically to say, hey, I just came across this URI of this aggregation or of this aggregated resource, how about I want to dereference that now, but I want to know what the state was at a certain moment in time. I want to do that at the protocol level. And this is, of course, where Memento comes in. And Memento is a project that also I've been working on for a few years. This was not motivated by a scholarly use case, but has consequences uh, for scholarly communication also. The consideration in Memento is that the web uh, <coughs> is, you know, uh, that resources on the web evolve over time, 
And when you have a URI of a resource and you dereference it, you can only obtain its current representation, even though there may exist prior representations of that uh, resource. And so Memento is all about how can I use that original URI, the one I sent you an email or the one I bookmarked, how can I use that URI to obtain not the current state of that resource, but a prior uh, state of it? In order to explain how this works, I'm going to show you something that you actually already know. And this is an old CNN.com page in the web archive from the 9-11 uh, attacks. And the pattern that you see is that the original CNN.com page is obviously at this URI. And when you go there, you'll find the current representation of that resource. But this one that sits in the Internet Archive has obviously a different uh, URI. You see the same kind of pattern in content management systems, where this here at the bottom is the generic URI for the resource about the September 11 attacks. And an old version of this has a different URI. And here it goes. And this is a notion that we actually leverage in Memento. So what I've shown you is that <coughs> there's these versioned resources. And each of these versioned resources have their own URI. We call these time-specific resources. This one exists between time 0 and time 1. This time 1, time 2, time 2, time 3. So these are these you know, URI M's that I've showed you in the previous slides. At the same time, in many cases on the web, you also see these generic URIs, time generic resources. This is the URI R, where basically at any moment in time, you get the then current representation. So at time zero, I get the current representation. Time one, I get the current representation. Time two, I always get the current uh, representation. This is not something Memento invents. Again, this is a pattern that you see all over the web. This is just an example from a W3C specification where you see that pattern. The latest version, so the current version is always available at this time generic URI. This version, so this latest version also has a time specific URI and here's a time specific URI for the previous version, okay? So this just happens out there. And so the question that Memento answers is how do we get this URI R, this time generic URI, how do we get from here to one of those by using a, a time dimension? <coughs> Memento extends the HTTP protocol in a small way uh, to achieve that. It introduces a kind of resource that we call a time gate that knows about the entire history of this resource, provides a link uh, to it, and then at the level of this resource, of this time gate, one can apply content, negoti con content negotiation in the time dimension to arrive at an appropriate uh, temporal uh, URI. Rather than explaining a lot of detail how that works, I'm actually going to give you a demo. I don't think I've ever really given a demo of Memento at a meeting, so here I go. Let's hope this works. It's not a live demo, fortunately. So what you're going to see, what you're going to see is actually a movie that we recorded in an attempt to convince the editors of Wikipedia to natively implement Memento. And actually, the editors were convinced that Wikipedia should natively have Memento. And we had software to provide them with. And the software went through a whole generation of back and forth and, you know, additions and optimizations and so on. This entire process that I described in a few seconds basically took a year. And at the very last moment, the master guru technician uh, over there decided it was not going to happen because the software uh, was not in good shape. We haven't given up. We're, you know, revising the software. And so eventually 
I think uh, MediaWiki installations and Wikipedia will be uh, natively Memento compliant. Anyhow, I'm going to give you a little demo of time travel using uh, Memento. So I'm starting here with the first page. <coughs> this is a page that we have set up in 2009. And this page and these images basically changes every day. And the content of it is actively archived, in, you know, an archive that we keep at Los Alamos and at Old uh, Dominion University where my colleague uh, Michael Nelson works, okay? So what we're going to see is, I'm going to use this, uh, I hope you enjoy that, I did. Every time I see it, I enjoy it. <coughs> and I also, somehow I did lose my slides here. Oh no, here they're back. All right, here we were. <coughs> Anyhow, having seen this demonstration, I think you can understand the power of Memento in the context of these evolving research objects and in the attempt to address this notion of how can we reconstruct, how can we look back at what the state of such a research object was at the given moment in time? So here I depict two resources. You know, let's just say they're two interdependent resources that sit in such a resource object. And they evolve uh, over time. Now, as long as I can, in one way or another, create archival versions of these resources, for example, through editorial processes, by saying, okay, I need a version now, I need a snapshot version now, I need a snapshot version now. Or, for example, using web archiving techniques, where you go in crawling or by transactional archiving. As long as I can do that for these resources that are involved in the research object, I will actually be able to say, hey, what was the state of these two resources at a certain moment in time? Well, I dereference these URIs subject to Memento, and I find that, oh, at this moment in time, this was the active version of that resource, 
And this was the active version of that resource. And you literally can scroll back your thing uh, in time. So we have another technology that is a, a potential component for research objects. Obviously, you need to proactively make versions, archive those materials, and timestamp them. But when you do that, it is possible to navigate towards all states of these uh, resources uh, using Memento. There's one more component that I want to talk about, and then I'm going to wrap up, and is this whole notion of uh, provenance. <coughs> provenance is not something uh, I've been working on uh, in any kind of detail. Provenance is this whole notion of being able to audit, to look back at what happened, okay? And to have the information, it's almost like a log of what has been going on with certain resources. Uh, how did uh, this piece of software act upon this data to achieve that result? This kind of the notion uh, of uh, provenance. As I said, I haven't done any kind of real work in that realm, but the people in the workflow community have uh, and have come up with the open provenance model. And as a wonderful indication of how scholarly communication is evolving towards being web native, these people took their effort also to the W3C. And as a result of that, we now have the W3C provenance specification that can be applied to web documents, but that can be applied to uh, all kinds of materials uh, emerging from scholarly communication and scientific endeavors also. I'm not at all an expert uh, in these matters. I had it on the top of my agenda to prepare and say something more meaningful about it for uh, this talk, but uh, I'm afraid I didn't find uh, the time. All of this to say that we went over a couple of core requirements and technologies required for the constitution of these research objects, and we found four potential technologies that could be used uh, in uh, their uh, topology. Three of those technologies I've actually been involved in creating myself, and looking at it that way, you would almost think I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Given these kind of the technologies, that doesn't mean that the whole endeavor to come up with the resource object specification is going to be simple. This is an extremely complex matter, and I anticipate that this W3C community group will have years of work to come up with an eventual specification of what this all looks like. Let alone be this whole notion of what does the entire scholarly communication system built around these research objects look like? What does registration look like? How are we going to certify these things? How are we going to discover them, archive them, and what is the rewarding structure when these kind of objects are being published? All open questions and extremely important ones. There's two more projects that I briefly want to mention that somehow can uh, play a role or provide some information in this realm. In the uh, area of discovery, I'm currently working on a project that is called Resourcing. Resourcing is literally about synchronizing resources uh, across the web. It is kind of the protocol for metadata harvesting put into the 21st century. So it all builds on, again, the primitives of the architecture of the World Wide Web. <coughs> um, there's a specification out there already. If this is an issue that you're interested in, how do you move resources from A to B and keep them synchronized? This might be a spec that you want to look at. And then there's a brand new project uh, with the University of Edinburgh that I'm involved in. It's called uh, Hyperlink. And Hyperlink looks at the problem of what we've started to call a uh, reference rot. I think you all know what citation rot is. Citation rot is this whole notion that you have a URI that is cited in a scholarly paper. You click it and you get a 404, right? That's citation rot. This is a problem that's been studied to quite an extent, but not to the massive scale that we're going to do it uh, in this project. 
We're going to go beyond that, actually. <coughs> Current citation um, studies really only look at when I dereference the URI, do I get something back, something meaningful, or do I get a 404 back? We are actually going to look into the whole problem of, well, in case I get something back, is what I get back even remotely representative of what was cited at that moment in time? You all know that domain names get taken over and so on, and I've been in publications literally where I click a link and I up and, uh, end up at a porn site. I'm not kidding you, okay? So this is stuff that is not being taken into account by traditional citation rot studies, but this is something we're going to look at in the hyperlink uh, project. In addition to that, so that's kind of the theoretical part of that, in addition to that, with our collaborators at Edina, we're going to look into proactive ways to archive referenced URIs. So URIs, resources that are referenced in scholarly uh, publications. So how could we, as part of the whole publication cycle, more proactively start archiving and preserving uh, these uh, cited uh, <coughs> resources. All right, I think it was clear that I've talked about uh, research objects. If not, I've totally failed. <coughs> As I mentioned, there's a W3C community group that will uh, discuss this. You can freely uh, enroll in all of that. There's no uh, strings attached. If research objects are not really what you're interested in, then I hope that maybe some of the technologies that I've mentioned uh, may be of uh, use to you. And with that, I'm going to close and thank you for your attention.